Would you welcome Pastor Randy Stone? Amen. Thank you, my friend. I wrote on the board, Christian or ministry horror stories. Does anyone, this is going to be a conversation between us. There's nobody watching, just us. <laughs> because we're all family, we're all part of the body of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's the head, yes. and sometimes we feel like the tail. Yep. Especially in ministry. Is there, uh, is there any ministry horror stories you'd like to share? <laughs> Not counting this one? Oh, no, the post office was shut down for crying out loud. I did, I never, 48 years I've been alive, I've never heard of the post office being shut down. How about, how about, at the, at the point of... Here we go. Here we go. Don't lie. Don't lie. <laughs> Do you understand? No. Okay. How about at the at the point of having 300 members yeah. and breaking ground, cleared acres yeah. for a new building that the strategic planning team quits yeah. the ministry? And I won't include everybody who's on the strategic planning team. But they know. He wasn't there. No, he wasn't there. He was already gone. They were right. gone. He left. Or he would have kept. The, he would have kept the strategic planning team it, functioning. It, it kept. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and you're left wondering what's going on. And, but you remember that six years before, the prophet comes to town, is on your board, and says the ministry is going to go under because you won't go where God wants you to go, like this. And I didn't believe it. I was like. God, surely it's not going under. We're getting bigger all the time. I'm traveling all over the world. We're on international television, and it's going to fail. You know, I love the prophet, but I didn't receive, didn't believe the word. And six years later, the reality hits, and it got worse. But that's enough. They, I mean, it, that's, that's. Would we qualify that as a ministry of horror story? That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and you're left there going, okay, now what? That's a really great place to start because we're not in ministry to count on people. We are to count on the Holy Spirit. And just as Walter said, the Holy Spirit tried to warn him of what was going to happen. And it was only after probably many years later that he come to grips and said, yeah, the Holy Spirit told me what was going to happen. I didn't listen. Therefore, I got experience. Self-inflicted experience. There is an exercise sometimes I do, and it's called victim responsible. And we like to go out and act like things have happened out of our control. We didn't have anything to do with it, yet it still fell apart. We don't get the, we don't, as leaders, we don't have the luxury of complaining that everybody left. It is a luxury to complain that everybody left. It, if there's no, God has a solution. If he can build the whole world in six days and rest on the seventh day, he can certainly handle whatever is going on at Happy Valley Fellowship. 
<clears throat> However, we need to be in tune with him. If we start earlier, who? there are more victim stories. I run a recovery home. I have heard lots of stories. But when someone starts earlier in the story, or they take the emotion out of the story, or they say, I chose to, you can't prevent what happened, but you can prevent it from happening again. I chose to not listen. I chose to stay. And so then this happened. Now, we're going to say, was it right or was it wrong? Who cares? It doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything if it's right or wrong. Guess what? People are going to be right. And then people are going to be wrong. That's what's going to happen. Now you know. What does that have to do with the mandate, the goal, the objective, the assignment is the word I use, God's assignment on your life. If you can be distracted by those things, you will never accomplish your assignment. And the kingdom of God is not infiltrated into our communities as it should be. I don't care what the devil does. I don't care what the snowstorm does. It has nothing to do with where I'm going. This meeting of 25 people or whatever it is that comes here is fine because this is a start. We are going to 250 people at Life Point Christian Faith Center. That's what's happening. You don't believe it? Hide and watch. I really don't care. God is going to get his mission accomplished and he will exchange the people Amen. to get the mission accomplished. So if you want to be on the trip, cool. If you don't want to be on, be on the trip, cool. We still love you. But this is what's happening. Now, I graduated Bible school from Jerry Savelle's Bible school. He'll be here uh, next month in, in March. Graduated in 2002. Started a church in 2003. We started to cook. We had a, we, our whole county. I love your area. I love this 380 corridor. I think If you can't grow a church here, your wood's wet. <clears throat> My county has 44,000 people. And there's only two towns with stoplights. We grew a church from zero in my living room with no money, no nothing, to over 100 in a town of 800 in three years. And we were cooking. Things were good. But then something happened. I was incompetent on how to handle the success that was going to happen. And I looked for, called out, asked, made maybe hundreds of phone calls, literally at least 50, 60, 70 phone calls to try and find people that would help me do what we're doing because I knew I was over my head. Right. Have you seen Tom Stammon? Tom Stammon said, you're over your head. So in 2009, my leaders decided they wanted to go left. I decided we should go right. So they left. <laughs> we went from 80 to 100 people every service to 20. But the bills were the same. <laughs> Guess what I did? I blamed them. How could they treat me that way? How could they do this? Because I was hurt. 
This story happens over and over again in ministry because of lack of discipleship. We were not prepared. See what, these aren't Sharpies, are they? They look like Sharpies. All right. I won't want to wreck your board, then I would owe you a board. So you have you here. We'll just say, we don't have erasers. We'll say that's X. Can you see an X? Right? And we go into ministry and we want to reach Z. Right? What's going on? This was supposed to be green. There's my racer. <clears throat> we are, listen, listen. This is important. We are supposed to reach Z. This is who we're looking for. This is why we get into ministry. We want to see lives changed. We want to see people disciple. We want to see people come to Jesus Christ because my life was really awful without Jesus Christ. Now I got Jesus Christ and it's a whole lot better. Right? That's the idea of ministry. And so... Here... Touch of me, Mike. See, I'm a real person. You can look me in the eyeball. I, I, I don't know where you live, but I've come this far. I would even come to your house. <clears throat> if we are busy meeting Z, if we are busy trying to grow the ministry and reach as many people as possible, there's no way we can get to all of them on a heart level. You can't do it. You can't take that much adversity or pain. Or it is messy to get involved with people's lives. Because... Stuff happens. People don't do what they're supposed to do. They didn't get your copy of the script of how it's supposed to work out. So we need something in the middle, and we need a why. If you're busy out trying to reach Z without Y, you're not going to complete X, Y, Z. That doesn't mean your zipper's down. <laughs> Which Steve pointed out to me before we left the room, and I said it is not down. <clears throat> True story. This is who we need to reach. Now, how many people can you actually disciple? If you say any more than five or six, you probably it's probably too many. So Dr. Radke, if you've seen his training, he says a team of five, right? Here is one of the reasons. You, you cannot disciple unless you're eyeball to eyeball. Because if I'm going to disciple Christine, she has to look at me and she has to believe that I'm telling the truth. Yes. Otherwise, she gets to make up whatever she wants about me. And that's why people make up whatever they want about ministers. They can't get eyeball to eyeball with everybody. It's impossible. So after our church fell apart, we merged with an Assembly of God church, and we went on for four years with them. The Lord sent me to go work in a car dealership because I needed more work. I needed to work. <laughs> after three years of the car dealership, he sent me back to work in the ministry. Now, when you go into ministry, you're thinking <clears throat> people are getting saved. You're thinking people's smiles on their faces. You're thinking he's going to send you into good things. 
Who's that? Who's that prophet where he said, go marry a hooker? Hosea, Hosea right? Well, I was the modern day Hosea. I didn't marry a hooker. I was already married. However, <laughs> he sent me 35 miles north to a ministry where the pastor was having sexual relations with the residents of the recovery home and had misappropriated about $70,000. We had a bill to the IRS for over 10 grand for not paying the taxes on the, the payments, what do you call it, employment tax, for not paying the employment tax. And then the state of Minnesota is kind enough to house people and pay us but when they leave, we have to let the state of Minnesota know they left so they don't pay us. Well, the, the people would leave and they would forget to tell the state of Minnesota. So they racked up. You know what that name does to a community, right? They had a horrible name. It was called the Fish House. <laughs> horrible name. That's where the Lord sent me. I said, I, I, went to, I went to people I trust. I said, is this, do you really think the Lord wants? Because he didn't let me know about all that mess before I got there. <laughs> the Lord is going to send you into a dark place because you're the light of the world. Because I had been through and fought that other battle, I was well prepared for this next one. And I said, if you put me back in the game, this is going to turn out different. When I got there, they said, they, they got the ministry leaders of the town together at one of the major pastor's house and said, you know, this is, has a really bad name, and we think we should just put it to bed and stop. And I said, that sounds like a fine idea, except for this is where the Lord sent me. And I wish he hadn't. But since he sent me here, I know he did not send me here to fail. So that's not happening. Even though on paper, see, here's the, here's the Christian thing that they were telling me to do is rack up all this debt, rack up all this mess, and then run away. <clears throat> That'll be the day. That is not the Christian thing to do. To me... And so I said, we're going to turn this around. Well, we just don't think that's possible. I said, hide and watch. Right. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear from them for two years. And we continued to have a horrible name. This is a town of 8,000 people just north of Minneapolis. So every time I'd say, yeah, I'm from the Fish House or River City Recovery Ministries is what we call it now. They go, oh, you know, one of our places is called the House of Hope. They were calling it the House of Dope. When I walked in that ministry, there was eight residents. Every single one of them were using drugs in the sober house. I'm like, I can't even tell you how crazy the, the directors of the, were when I, when I started there. It, all I'm saying, it was horrible. This is what we walk into so that we can straighten it out. It's no, quit complaining that the, the world is, the world, they, they're, that's what they do. <laughs> they don't know any better. So what did we do? I got one guy, he was a retired businessman, had a seed business in northern Minnesota. One, he was a Baptist guy. And never talked a day in tongues and day in his life. Yet he's a spirit-filled man. And 
He was very naive about the ways of drug addicts. <laughs> we have, we can have 20 to 25 drug addicts. We have three homes and they stay with us from four to nine months to a year, sometimes over. And that's, that's what they do. And he didn't know about that. So we had to educate him on how drug addicts lie, cheat, and steal. I am the most lied to person I know of. <clears throat> then his church started to watch us. First Baptist Church. Then another church started to watch us. And then some other people thought, well, maybe it's safe after three years. After three and a half years, we paid off all that money to all the counties to where it was at. We couldn't solicit money. We could receive money, but we couldn't solicit any because of the IRS rules. Now, five years later, we partner with four of those churches where they're sending their top people in to teach our residents where we can use their, some of their facilities sometimes to teach our residents, where they've given money to help our residents get, a, get ahead and go forward. The name is River City Recovery Ministries, and it has a good name. It's restored. We get about between 50 and 60, 60 70, 70 people it's, it's very transient. Some stay with us a couple weeks, some stay a couple days, some stay a year. But that many come through the program. Now, our success rate is about 30%, which is really above a national average. And here's why. It's because we deal with the causes of use and abuse, not just a symptom. And so sometimes it's a trauma. Sometimes it's childhood trauma. Sometimes it's a death in the family. Sometimes it's a divorce. Sometimes it's all sorts of things, but it's, sometimes it's mental health. Sometimes it's bipolar. Sometimes it's autism. We just don't know what's going to come out of those doors. And we need to be prepared as we can by the leading of the Holy Spirit to handle whatever is coming. Now, sometimes people are too... Uh, mentally unstable for us to handle because it's a peer group oriented program that we have to refer them somewhere else. However, the program has been restored. Families have been restored. The leaders I have now, you, they're, they're all about 18 months sober, besides the retired feed guy. He's, he never had a problem with use, using in the first place. But what I've had to do is take them from zero, sometimes under zero. Uh, we were trying to get Angie here. I don't think she's going to be able to make it because of another story. Maybe I'll tell you later on this weekend. But <clears throat> we've raised them all. They didn't come to us put together. And they come to us really, really, really broken. Now, the normal church is not going to come to you that broken. If they do, I mean, you still can fix them. They, they need Jesus Christ, right? But how does it happen? It happens, happens like this. I know their favorite color. I know when things go well. I know when things go bad. I can look at them and I know where they are. They love me. They do. They love me. And when we talk about it, we get choked up because we love one another. So we're not doing this because I told them to. We're doing this because we love one another. And if we're really going to reach the world, you got to, this is good. But there's only a small depth of relationship that happens with people out there. 
with people beyond. But when you have your team of people that you work with and that you build the kingdom with, that's, that's what really transforms things. So we have the, everything we do now is from any, most every situation I hand off to them. I say, here, what are we going to do about this? If they, we got into a, we got into a problem. Man, 56 years old was with us about eight months. He seemed to be doing okay. And I gave him a responsibility of our van. And he was supposed to use the van to go and get groceries and come back. And that's kind of it. Give a ride to meetings and whatnot. Well, he said to our, to Angie, Angie, if you're watching, he said to Angie, can I go? This is what's called an upscale mugging. He says, can on Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday night, can I go to Minneapolis and see my daughter who's in the hospital? What would you say? 56 year old man is demonstrating decent character. Andrew says, yes. Why? Angie gets manipulated. Why did Angie get manipulated? Because she didn't count on her team. And, and later, what, what he did was he went to Minneapolis or he went somewhere. And then he texted me. He says, I'm in Minneapolis. I visited my daughter in the hospital. He has two daughters. Can I stay the night? with my other daughter because it's snowy and go to the social security office in the morning because he's trying to get on disability and I'll be back by the one o'clock meeting. Guess what I say? Yes. Why not? Angie already said it's okay. One o'clock next day, Monday. This is just last Monday. This is why Angie can't get here. He calls me a hundred miles away from Minneapolis says, I crashed the van. It's totaled. Can you come get me? <clears throat> I said, try and find a way home. And I let him sit there six hours. Because he is technically a vulnerable adult, we sent somebody to get him, and we held him accountable the next day for his manipulation. See, a team, if we all had handled this right, see, I don't have it all together. Nobody does. You see big ministry, they don't have it all together. I've been around them. They don't have it all together. And it's not a matter of right and wrong. It's just there's people involved. So there's consequences to our actions. That's it. Can you handle the consequences? Don't make a mistake bigger than you are. So he's still at the house. He, he has to live with the people that he just manipulated and, and abused. But we still love him. We didn't throw him away. We didn't say, okay, you messed up. You have to go. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because we can have accountability. We can still have love and compassion. We have to work in teams. We have to trust one another. The people that love us the most should be on our team helping us the most. Those are the ones you should be pouring into. So if there's, if this is my team here and we pour in and we are doing the work of the ministry, we're handling the work of the ministry. We're handling the things that come down the, down the pipe together. But then you're working with others doing the exact same thing. Second Timothy 2, 2. There was Paul, Timothy, faithful men, and others. 
this is how we need to, this is, this is why this is getting to that person, to that why and trusting them. Now, I think the reason I brought it up was I gave Angie the authority to make a decision and it cost the ministry our only van. But it was her decision to make, and she did. I trust the people we give the authority to. You know what? Next time somebody says something, anything similar to, can I use the van? Next time there's an upscale mugging, you know who's not going to fall for it? Angie ain't falling for that again. You know how many times I had to tell her? None. Experience. Right? Do we trust our people enough to give them experience? Even if it makes us look stupid. You know how stupid I look calling our executive director and say, well, he's 100 miles away from where he's supposed to be. I felt stupid. Is that too harsh? Stupid? No. <laughs> so what, what is this all about? What do we want to do? What does Three Degrees want to do? Is if we're on a trajectory to go somewhere to do something, if we get more than three degrees off, we need to make corrections. And all of our lives are about making small corrections rather than huge ones. If a plane takes off from Cedar Rapids and goes to Phoenix, it's off course most of the time because it's making corrections. Why? Because there's wind, there's weather, there's, there's things that happen that blow it around. But it keeps making corrections, so then it lands at the exact same spot where it's supposed to land. It can't take off from Cedar Rapids and go to Phoenix and end up in San Francisco and say, you know, it was really windy. I just don't know how we got here. A leader's job is to stay focused on where you're going. Now, is this minor setback about a van? No, it's a minor setback. We're still growing. We're still developing people. I milked that van for $7,000 worth of education. The Lord knows we need a van. I'm not sweating it. We weren't angry. Nobody was angry. Is this the van? At least the guy didn't die. He didn't freeze to death. Right? But th this is, it's just part of, Part of doing it is part of doing part of doing ministry. Isn't that wonderful? <clears throat> Let's look at a couple of scriptures. How about that? Second, how about I tell you which ones they are? Um, Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. To thoroughly equip people in ministry, there is no percentage. In Ephesians 4, there's no percentage about equipping people. You are equipped or you are unequipped. You're wearing clothes or you're naked. We're not kind of equipped. When Angie is done working with me in River City Recovery Ministry, she will be equipped to do the work of the ministry because she's doing that. She's being trusted to do that. Does that make sense? It's to be equipped. Well, 
they just don't know what to do. If people you work with don't know what to do, you have not told them. <laughs> it's not them, it's you. Isn't that horrible? It's always you. That's terrible. <laughs> they just don't get it. If they ain't getting it, you are not giving it. It's just the truth. Communication is I say something and then you understand what it is I said. Trouble is when I say something, you might be wearing these. And so I tell you, and you go, uh-huh. But it has to go through these lenses. And then you don't understand even though you say yes. And then we say, we'll just tell her more. <laughs> so I say more. <laughs> and it goes through the lens and you say yes. But we still don't get the work done. Because you don't know what's going on because it's going through these lenses. What are some of these lenses? <clears throat> Speaking Christianese. You know anyone who speaks fluent Christianese? You know everything to say right in church, but when you look at your track record or results, it's under underwhelming. <laughs> how about how about long drawn out prayers <laughs> that are not filled with faith? How about I don't know, but if we just persevere through the end, I know if I just keep believing. The Lord's going to do something. If you keep believing the wrong thing, the Lord doesn't have anything to work with and nothing is going to happen except for you're going to get tired. Right. Lenses. We all have these lenses. People are not your source. Some people, here's a horrible lens. Maybe you know this guy. You've heard of this guy. Some people want to be famous first. <laughs> They're the ones making all the YouTube videos and nobody's watching them. <laughs> if I just get my name out there, enough people will follow me. And then... Right. Stupid. Just, just save YouTube the space and shut up and sit down. It's not that difficult. Go find somebody that needs help and help them. Go find someone that needs Jesus Christ and go help them find Jesus Christ. You know Jesus Christ? If you know Jesus Christ, it's pretty simple. Right? Yeah. I was walking through a prison doing ministry, not living there. Walking through a prison, looking around, looking real spiritual. Guy says, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking for people that need Jesus. <laughs> he looked at me like I was stupid, which I was. He says, they all need it. <laughs> I said, why don't I just start here with you? <laughs> some people here, or maybe some people not here, but some people on the internet, feel inadequate and that's a lens mm -hmm. so because of your inadequacy we'll change lenses because of the inadequate lens we're afraid to confront because I might hurt your feelings because I've known you a long time and if I hold you accountable well then you'll think I'm mean and it'll be horrible and so what we do is put personalities before the mission and paralyze the ministry. Now, is this the devil? 
Ain't no devil. Devil doesn't have to do anything. He just has to watch you. <clears throat> but we've all done it. I've done it. I put personalities before the mission. The mission is we're going to have a, a full recovery home and we're going to help people find Christ and help them recover from drug and alcoholism. That's what we're going to do. No, we're going to do it with you. We're going to do it without you. I don't care either one. I love you. I really will. We'll be friends afterwards. But this mission is coming first. That lens is off. You say what you want. Do it. The lens is off. The mission of from going from where you are now here at Life Point to 250 comes first. Everybody puts the mission first. Because it's not Tommy Robert's mission. It's God's mission. It's God's mission that you be involved and so entrenched in your community. They can't live without you. I am so entrenched. River City Recovery Ministries is so entrenched in Cambridge, Minnesota. They don't want to live without us. They say, if anything happens to you guys, we are really, we're in a tough spot. Who can fill your shoes? Who can do what you do? Oh, thank you so much for what you do. That should be about life point. What are you doing that's so important? How have you made this church so important to the community they can't live without you? You've got Jesus Christ for crying out loud. <laughs> we got everything they need. In this room, we have everything we need. Isn't that fantastic? And then he hides a mystery for you. The mystery for you is out there. Just waiting. All the people are born. I was, uh, Lynette and I were talking last night. How many people are in the, the 380 corridor? Four hundred thousand? Can they drive here? What percentage is 250 out of 400,000? Is, is that too hard for God? <laughs> no. I don't think it is. That cracks me up. <clears throat> mm. So... If I can't accomplish a goal, I know it's going to be. I know it's going to be people, money, or competence. Right, that's good. If I can't accomplish what the Lord sent me out to do, it's going to be I don't have the people, I don't have the money, and I don't have the competence. So if I get the competence, the wisdom, I can get the people and I can get the money. So I can accomplish what he said to do. Sometimes it's not the money that we need, it's the competence. Because when we have the competence, when we have the revelation, knowledge, understanding, then we see what to do. It's as if we shut off the lights and it becomes completely dark in here. We'll wander around and kind of fumble and bumble. But as soon as the light comes on, nothing's really changed. You just see differently. And you just see it differently. And so then you'll have answers that fast. Revelation. Isn't that great? That's a good word. So, are we maximizing our potential on a daily basis? Are we stretching our faith? If not, any excuse will do. I'm so obsessed with maximizing my faith, with trying to get as much as I can out of today. I just don't have time for excuses. It's not time for excuses. It's not, it's not the, any, do you know, do you know what I mean? Any excuse will do. The music. Well, people aren't coming because of the music. It's our space. They're not coming because of our space. You, you just pick one. When you lower your standards, when you take your eye off what the Lord said, you'll just pick an excuse and you'll settle for that. 
and feel justified in doing it. Letting yourself off the hook. This is why you need someone to be accountable to. Every single one of us do. Where are we going? What are we doing? How, what is important? What's important to God? I'm not going to lower my standards. We are going to reach what Three Degrees Ministries is going to do is going to make 12 to 15 hubs all over the, the, the United States. Like here, we're going to help you grow to reach the capacity, the potential that's inside you so that more leaders are developed, so that we reach more wise, so more lives are transformed and changed through the gospel. Amen. That's going to happen here. Amen. That's going to happen in Los Angeles when I go out there next month. That's what's going to, that is what's going to happen. And as we step out in faith, the Lord is going to meet us and we'll have these hubs set up within regions because it's difficult to go from here to North Carolina. But it's not so difficult to go from here to from Fort Dodge to here. It's not that difficult, right? And as this church grows to send more people out, then we'll send some more and make it even closer. And even closer. I'm so tired of not having anyone to run with. Right. Yeah. It, the, we've 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 overpromised and underdelivered. People are getting tired of this. <clears throat> I'm going to do one last thing, and then uh, then I think Steve is going to say something which he will because I'll sit down and then he'll have to. <laughs> who, is, uh, who is interested in a breakthrough? Amen. All right, Caleb, you and I have been talking on the phone. Come in, come in and help me out. What is it that you want to see happen in your life, ministry life, life in the next six months? What are some goals that you have set? Well, for the... We <laughs> okay, I'll keep it short. Well, uh, definitely to see our, our team grow, um, part of the discipleship and, and training team, but also uh, the things that we're working on is in evangelizing and wanting to, to get out in the community and also not just witnessing, but being able to bring in How more many? souls. How many? Oh my gosh, um, unlimited. I have not put in a number 250. There's only this... 400,000 here. <laughs> you have to we go with 250. There. There's 250, so to bring 250 souls in, Yes. Fantastic. What about personally? Do you think personally? Uh, personally, always um, more spiritual growth, growing more in the Lord. Um, Operating in spiritual gifts and callings and going forth and healing the sick and raising the dead, doing as Jesus went forth and, and doing consistently, you know. Um, I could go on. Right. So don't go anywhere. That sounds good, but there's nothing tangible to it. And it needs to be written down. See, in AANA, when you are a drunk or an alcoholic or a drug addict and you come in, one of the first things you should do is get a sponsor. And the sponsor will take you through the steps. And then I will say, do you have a sponsor? And they will say, yes. And then they will say, I'll say, what step are you on? And they'll say, we're on step three. And then I, I know what that is. And then we go through the steps. And then when they get to number 10, then there's like maintenance steps. So it's something we know concretely. This is what we all need to do. I put you on a spot because you're my friend and we talked twice on the phone. <clears throat> all right, but we're, but we're not done yet. These things need to be written down. Where are you going? What are you doing? Because to be more spiritual, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to be more spiritual. 
Okay, now I'm more spiritual than I was because I was thinking spiritual. <laughs> right? And there's something, see, how does it feel? A little bit uncomfortable, right? Of yes, it's a little bit uncomfortable. That's supposed to happen. <laughs> it's supposed to happen. Because when you're accountable, instead of watching another binge on Hulu or Netflix, you'll do something else. Because I know that he's going to say, what did you do? And you're going to be like, Ugh. and you don't want to look stupid. Not that you don't look stupid. Thank you. Right? Yeah. I'm just making a point for everybody because we all go through this. Yes. But if you don't have, if you're a Z and you don't have Y to be accountable to, you'll just blow it off. And if you're not a good Y, you won't call them or check on them. You won't care. And if you have 13 people to call on, you ain't calling on them because that's too many. But if you have five, six people to call on, like, hey, you can call on that many. You can actually be friends. You could actually like one another. Right? Right. We're just, we're just getting started. Now, now, to get all those things accomplished, all you have to do is this simple. Let's start over here. You're a good sport, by the way. I'm, I'm sorry I put you on the spot like that. Yeah, sorry I, I, I busted you down like I was <laughs> sorry. I'm really not sorry. <clears throat> but it just sounds like that's the thing that you're supposed to say to people. So to do that, all you have to do is go over, touch that wall, come back, and those things will be yours. Can you? Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. He was on it. What? Can you do it? Fantastic. So we get out of life. You know, we think about what we want. Who thinks about what we do? Who's getting everything they want out of life? <laughs> I had a boss that told me one time, he's like, your life is going to be miserable because you want to do stuff. <laughs> We get our life what we want or what we actually do? What we actually do, right? Yeah. yeah. That, that's normally how it works. Faith without is dead. Yeah. And so what do we say? Caleb, you had to do. What did you, yeah, what did we say you had to do in order to? Yeah. Oh, oh, whoa, 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 seriously, we know, we know this, we get out of life, what we want by what we say, or what we actually do, what we actually do, what we do, I hope I'm not offending you, am I offending you, that was my biggest fear coming in, I'd offend people. It's been known to happen. Just give it time. So what did we say you had to do? Right. All right. Wait. Wait. Just wait. Hold on. Now, out of life, we get what we say or what we do. Yep. <clears throat> It's a theme. What we actually do. What did we say you had to do to get what you wanted? Run and touch that wall, come back. Right? Wait, 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 <laughs> Hebrews 11 happened right there. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Come on, Caleb, we want to go home. Let's stop. Let's do this. 
Why did you wait? <laughs> because of the the pause of well, stop. It's just kind of like the the voice that we hear sometimes. It's telling us, well, you can't do that. You can't do that. And then it's kind of like we pause and we step back and it's like, well, wait a minute. Let me think about that. But God is telling us, go. You were able to do it. Yes. There was nothing. I didn't like physically tackle you. I just said, wait. I didn't actually touch you. No. This is what happens to us. Mm-hmm. Give, give him a hand. <clears throat> this is what happens to us. We see what God wants, but we won't step out and do it. Because we're waiting for someone to give us permission to go ahead. They're not going to do it. No one's going to give you permission to go do what you're supposed to do. Because this is where faith comes in. Now we can make up any excuse. We're used to, you know, and personally what I believe about this is from the child, time we're a child, we, grew, we all grew up in normal school around, you know, Iowa, Midwest, and you grow up in school and you have to ask for permission to go do everything. So then we're sitting there waiting for permission, watching our life go by, waiting for permission to just get out there and make a mess. I just like to go make a mess. Guess what? It's not going to turn out the way you think it is. You have it all pictured in your mind the way it's supposed to be, but it ain't going to go like that. It's probably be be 30 degrees below zero. (laughs) And and people's flights would be canceled. And then I heard today, yeah, there was snow. I didn't hear anything about that. And then there'll be snow and cars in the ditch. Big deal. Let's go touch the wall. Let's do it. They're not stopping anybody from doing anything. Is there order to it? Sure. Because it needs to follow the common vision of life point. (laughs) Their vision, we have a church. How that church, how that church is done. Now, what is? I'm sorry, I said I was. But it's out. What's it mean when a preacher looks at his watch? Wow. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. What was I saying? It was important. What? Right, right, and and, and there, that's their vision, right? How that gets done is yours. What, what area you're involved with is yours. And you're the CEO. You're the, you're the leader of it. And they're here to support you and your vision as well as you support them and the vision of the church. Here's, here's what I was thinking. How much, what is church? Hmm? Hmm? Okay, the church is the people, right? And, and we were talking about this last night. Is how, what percentage of your worship service is the church? Right? We need to think. It's a small, it's a, it's a percentage. It's significant. It's very significant. But it's not everything what a church does. How silly is that? The church, let's just say if you use the Pareto principle, 80, 20, 20% gets 80% of the results. Let's just say that the, the, just for, for our saying, it's 20, 30%. Okay, our worship service is 30%. It takes place one day a week, right? What's the church doing the rest of the time? You're the body, you're the church. What are you doing? What are you, where are you, where are you impactful? Where are you making yourself valuable to the the town here? The the Iowa City town. 
Where, where are you at? Where, where is your team at? How are you making yourself valuable outside of the, the four hours you have church? Right? That's the church, right? Isn't that, is it or not? Am I, am I all wet? The church isn't just we have a good worship service, send people home. Here's the thing, you guys. People want to know where they fit. If they don't know where they fit within your body, they don't fit and they become a misfit and they leave. I bet more than 250 people have come through here in the last nine years. Right? If we just kept them all, I can show you how to keep things. But if your mindset, if your lens, if you don't put on the love lens, <laughs> if we don't put on that other lens and see things accurately like God sees them, we're not going to hold on to them. And then so tomorrow, Saturday, we'll talk more about how to hold on to those people, how to reach them. Did you guys get something out of this? Well, miraculously, I met Steve. I started Three Degrees in 2016 and couldn't get it off of the ground. And a, and a man at Jerry Savelle's Ministers Conference said, you should call him. And I'm like, okay. I called him. And it turns out he had just had an experience. And it, it was, well, it was just a, a divine, divine setup. So the Lord has put us together to come from different ends of the candle. And uh, he's getting set. I have the microphone. <laughs> We're the same age. Who looks older? <laughs> I always tell him he looks older. I know, right? That was rough. He's got it through. I'm, I'm done. Amen. Ministry of Helps, critical to every church. Know where you fit in and serve that role. Amen. I may throw that in yet this week, and I got a great teaching on Ministry of Helps. All right. Um, get there. You do the evaluation every night or at the end? At the end, yeah. Okay. All right. Can everybody see this in the back? Is this visible? Everybody see that? All right. Pastor Steve Winters. Thank you. The uh, word of truth here tonight is... We are here to serve you, and I do want this to be an open forum. I want you to feel like you are able to speak, ask questions, pull from us as you need to for each of your own individual situations. We're going to get started here on another area of individual and church freedom. You can talk about church leadership, but if there's individual bondage, you're going to bring that into leadership. So we're here to talk about freedom at every level of the Christian life. Individual, family, church, employment, freedom from the world, and this thing called debt. Ugly four-letter word. So, all right. So, empowered in spiritual and financial leadership, discover the power of freedom. Debt freedom. What do you think? You ever thought that was possible in your own individual life? Anybody here debt free? Anybody here owe the world nothing? I have about a half a dozen hands in this room. Amen. We're going to get to you also. 
We're going to speak at the level of debt. We're going to speak to the level of being out of debt. And now, if you're out of debt, what do you do there? So let's move into the coursework here. All right, I'll use the space bar. There we go. All right, what we are covering here tonight is going to be debt. We're going to be hitting this one pretty hard because this is a tool that the enemy is using today that is destroying the church. It's destroying families, it's destroying marriages, it's destroying the church. But get this next point. Stick around and you're going to learn about how we're going to use debt to find money. Now there's an interesting twist, huh? All right. We're going to talk about interest, how interest can be your biggest enemy, but it can also be your greatest tool. We're going to talk about budgets. And there's another one of those words. Finding fragrance, fragments. It's amazing what you can do to roll a budget upside down and make it positive if you are honest with yourself and you look for what's called the fragments. We're going to talk about insurance. One of my favorites, probably one of the most dry topics you could possibly think of, and yet one of my favorites because it's probably the easiest place to find money. We're going to talk about insurance. We're going to talk about taxes. There's another one. And this timing of this, with it being January 31st, what timing on talking about taxes, huh? And one of my favorites is self-employment. One of my favorites is to talk to people that think they have a passion, that they want to get into business for themselves. And what's beautiful about the self-employment is that that teaching not only applies to an individual that thinks that they've got what it takes to go into business for themselves, but what about starting a church? What about starting an income stream for a church? What about the church reaching out into a new endeavor? It all works together. All of it works together. And then there's the tithing. You can go home right now if you think that tithing is not for you. That's how important tithing is going to be, and that's going to be the capstone of what we're going to talk about here this weekend. Yes, so do you have that mouse working? Is it advancing? There we go. All right, ground rules. And I'll get to introducing myself here in just a minute, but ground rules. You're in a good place. Despite the weather, you're here. I want to say you're not only in a good place, but you're also in a safe place. We need to be friends. Who here are LifePoint members and you know each other and you fellowship together in the same flock? Who's LifePoint in here? Okay, almost everybody. Amen. A couple that are not visiting, family. Amen. And I had one person here that's not LifePoint? Two? Okay. Welcome. Thank you for coming. All right, a good place and a safe place. I want to stop for a one minute right now and just say that I want to give thanksgiving to our Lord Jesus Christ and my guardian angels on my drive down here today. I left at 6 o'clock this morning. It's 25 below zero. I drive a truck, rear wheel drive. I've got sandbags. And there were two incidents up around Green Bay as I was coming down where it was a near miss. It was just people that, whether it was my lack of observation or their driving, it doesn't matter. There was no incident there but then I got about 30 miles outside of town here and I was driving like 50 miles an hour it's snowing traffic is passing me in the left lane I don't understand how they kept traction there was a lot of cars in the ditch but my truck I'm on the phone with my wife and my truck all of a sudden just went sideways I mean when I say sideways it was sideways sliding down the interstate no other car was having a problem but my truck was sideways I was over drifting in through the left lane, and we're going to talk about words and the power of words, and I am, I am very embarrassed to admit this, but I'm on the phone with my wife. I'm sideways going down the interstate at 50 miles an hour, and all I said was two words. It wasn't, Jesus, help. It wasn't, I'm good. No, rather, I yelled out into the phone, I'm done. It was a bad confession. But with a pickup truck, praise God, the front wheel stayed sliding, the rear wheels caught drive pavement, the rear end went back to where it was supposed to be, and I moved back into the right lane again and slowed down. So the Lord is good. So I called Randy with my heart still pumping, and uh, I said, Randy, with all of this opposition, the Lord is up to something this weekend. The Lord is up to something this week, and between the flight delays, between the cold weather, with the snow that's coming in, this is no accident. You're in a good place. You're in a very good place. 
And when I get down here, I'm going to say more about it. But please know, you don't want to miss any of this. If for some reason you can't be here, try to get it streaming and get this information. My information will continue to build. Pastor Rain is going to continue to build. You're going to start to be seeing the mesh between my material and what Pastor Randy is teaching as how the leadership and on how these freedoms all tie together to make a healthy church, to make a healthy home, to make a healthy marriage, to raise healthy kids, and to not pass on anything to the next generation. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, a verse that we are very, very familiar with. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death, the curse. Brackets are mine. Romans 8.1. There's no condemnation. If you choose, I promise you this material works. Why? Because I, as I give my testimony in here, I'm living proof that what I teach, I've lived. I've applied it. It's real. It works. By the time you leave here this weekend, those of you that do have debt could leave here. If you apply yourself in these sessions, you could leave here by Sunday morning with a positive budget and with a plan to be debt-free and I'm going to go on a limb and say probably less than 10 years, and I'll show you how that works. Mortgage, student loans, credit cards, car payments, all of it gone in 10 years or less. And there's a formula why I'm able to say that, and it's what the banks would use also called the debt ratio. We're going to talk about it. Stick around. There's a lot to learn and a lot of material to go over. But please be free to share your own personal questions, your own personal situations. Bring me a budget. Let's look at it while I'm still here. Or if you really enjoy what we're having to say down here, talk to pastor and get us back. Amen. We're not that far away. It's a practical course with personal applications that involve both spiritual and natural solutions. That's a mouthful. Let's break that down. This is a practical course with personal applications. This is a workshop. I want you to work. I want you to apply yourself. Apply what you're learning. Think about your own situations. Bring it to the table. There's no condemnation. Personal applications that involve both spiritual and natural solutions. We are going to take advantage of what man has put in place in the secular world. We're going to use it to our advantage to flip what is a curse right now or may feel like a curse on its head. Use it to our advantage so that we may be out of debt, that we may increase retirement, that we may find fragments, find wealth. Wealth management. For those of you that are debt-free, don't think that it's not relevant to you because you are the voice. Once freedom comes, how loud can your voice be in the voice of the next generation to your grandchildren, to your own children? If you understand the parameters and the boundaries of debt, the curse that it is, and you yourselves are free, how much with knowledge, my people perish for lack of knowledge, that if you have the knowledge, we don't dare stay silent, we're going to be held accountable for the truth that we have learned, is what the Bible says. Live according to what you've attained. You're here. You're learning. If it doesn't apply to you, the debt portion of it, take it to somebody else. Take it to somebody else. It's part of that XYZ equation. The spiritual solutions, a lot of these spiritual solutions are going to be familiar. You can go to any conference. You can go to any meeting, and you can hear spiritual solutions to just about every life's issue. But how are you applying it? Or does your application lack a fullness of understanding that just one thing that I or Pastor Randy may say this weekend, that all of a sudden that Holy Spirit light bulb goes on and it's become that aha moment of what I need to apply in my life to make a difference. Be expecting. Be expecting. I don't want to leave the thought or this slide without the last words that you read of be expecting. Own the vision, not the position. I'm going to plant a vision. The Lord is going to take that vision and give it the increase. Paul and Apollos talks about putting out the seed, someone else waters it, God gives the increase. There's a Holy Spirit vision in every one of you. There's a destiny. There's a purpose. Behold, I know the plans I have for you, plans for a future, an expected end, hope and a future. We all have a destiny. We all have a place that we're going that God has called us to. In him we live, move, and have our being. The vision will be birthed 
when you give up your position. The position that you are holding yourself in right now of when you look in the mirror, of when you say, I am in this situation, or I'm never able to fill in the blank, don't own your position anymore. Your position is in Christ. Sunday morning, we're going to hit that really hard. We're going to come back to that. Allow conviction to have its course. There's going to be things in here that are going to sound offensive. There's going to be things in here that are going to dig. But I promise you, absolutely, God is faithful to his truth. As we're going over things in here, and you start feeling that itch of conviction within you, you allow it to run its course, whatever that may mean. That's the increase. That's the change. That's the application. That's where this meeting is going to stand out from previous ones, where maybe you didn't allow that, or it didn't take full root in good soil. We're after the good soil tonight, this weekend. And then again, be expecting. By be expecting, I mean, get out of your head. Let this be a spiritual weekend. Stop hearing me in your ears here. Start listening from here. Be expecting. Allow God to show up. He's here. He's faithful. But if you don't give God the opportunity to move because you are just in your head and you are not expecting, you are not hungry for him to speak to you individually, to take this information for you to apply it to your own heart, this becomes another meeting. And by Monday morning, you're back at your 9 to 5, still trying to figure out how to make your minimum payments. Insanity. Trying to do the same thing, expecting a different result, and it never works. Be expecting, be hungry, and expect the Lord to change. For you to go home with the tools that you need between you and God, your spouse, to make a difference. Psalm 18:16. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. It doesn't matter how deep you are. Pastor Randy touched on that. We're going to touch on that again. It makes no difference what your status is in life right now absolutely makes no difference. Slide, please. I guess I have the most. Oh, let's go back one. All right. There. Yeah, let's, uh, so Randy touched on, I get a text one day from a guy in Texas, and he said, you know, there's a pastor up by you in Wisconsin, you guys are close together, and I think maybe I ought to call him. What's really funny is I checked into my room here today, and that same guy texted another name of a phone, in a phone number of another guy, he said, you really ought to talk to this guy. But uh, this gentleman sends me the phone number, and I called up Pastor Randy, and we talked on the phone a couple of times, maybe a couple hours, sort of like Randy and Caleb and uh, that long relationship that you had where you felt like you could pick on him tonight. <laughs> and uh, we talked on the phone a couple of times, and we were both heading to Dr. Barkley, Mark Barkley in Midland, Michigan. We were heading down to his leadership conference. I said, well, why don't you come on over and meet me? We'll drive together. You can stay at my house. I bet that, I, what, an hour and a half on the phone, maybe I knew you, and I was inviting you to my house to stay overnight. Well, this is who we got to meet, and this is what I talk about when I say God gives the increase. As you get to know me, and you look at that picture right there, you are going to understand it doesn't matter how deep of a hole. It doesn't matter how ashamed you may be of your past. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. Guess what? I am living proof that I serve a Redeemer. Amen. My lovely wife, my oldest two, Elena and Grace, Caleb, my only son, I don't know. Randy's his favorite, I don't know. 
And we got Eliana, we got Lila, and then we got our little Ava. And if you want to put anything up before the Lord, we're believing that our quiver is not full till we reach eight. So we're believing for two more. <laughs> Amen. So yeah. this is my family, and we are blessed. So more on that later. I just wanted to introduce you to my lovely family. So who am I? And then we're going to get into this slide here. I come from a little town up in the Upper Peninsula called Iron Mountain. And about 10 years ago, Caleb is going to be nine. So about nine years ago, he was just, my wife was pregnant with Caleb. And I was working a $30,000 a year job as an operations manager for a trucking firm. And not happy. I was employed because I was supposed to be employed, but I just was not feeling fulfilled at all. We're going to touch on that. And uh, the president of the company walked in one day on a Friday at 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon and said, we are insolvent. Go home and don't come back to work. Never got my last paycheck. So I stepped out into the foyerway, the breezeway of the office, and I called my wife. And we had had plans of going down to Green Bay to go shopping that night with, it was just Elaine and Grace at the time. And I called my wife and I said, I just lost my job. Business is closed, bankrupt, insolvent. I'm told not to come back to work. We're supposed to go to Green Bay. What do you want to do? She said, does it matter? We have plans. Let's go. My wife also has a story about understanding the provision of the Lord. And at that time, she was much more living it, and it was more truth to her than what I possessed at the time. So we went down to Green Bay. We had a great time. And one thing led to another, and the low places in life is where we make the greatest strides in God. And that's human. It's unfortunate, but that's human. Our lowest place is our greatest advancement. And I would like to be able to stand up here and say, that grace is sufficient for us to not experience those things. But we all have been here. We've all been here. So one thing led to another, and I had graduated already in college with a library of degrees. It was about the only thing I was good at as I was growing up with school. It's the only thing I felt I was good at. So I just stayed in school and let the government pay my way. And uh, I stayed in school. I ended up with a degree in law. I ended up with a degree in business. I ended up with a degree in corporate finance. And then I went back and got another degree in business. So guess what? I'm a businessman. The church calls it a marketplace minister. I'm an ordained pastor. And after I got unemployed, I ended up getting hired by a friend of mine to become his bookkeeper at his business. I started trading a private portfolio in the commodities market, and I was working as a bookkeeper for this construction company. And one thing led to another, and the Lord birthed a niche in my heart. And we're all after that niche, whatever your niche is. Mine was self-employment to be a financial consultant to small business of individuals that love to pound the nails and they love to do the trade. They love to make the product, but they hated the book work. They didn't like working with the government. They didn't like all of the filings. They didn't like the payroll. They didn't like the bookkeeping. They didn't like the taxes, the insurance, and dealing with the audits. And I stepped in, found a niche, and I am blessed. I have found my place, and uh, the company I'm with right now, I had 11 companies at one time with employees, and that all was weaned back to what I have for a current employer right now. I've been with him now for 31 months, but in the first 30 months, uh, his gross that first year was $350,000 when I came in, and we just put $3 million on the books in 30 months, from 350,000 to 3 million. And it's just simply applying the tools. The world has offered a palette of tools that applied appropriately with the right passion. Welcome to joy, welcome to peace, welcome to fulfillment. So that's where I come from, I'm a businessman. And I've consulted with, I did a technology startup in Minneapolis. I did an oil field startup down in Texas. I've done several construction companies. I currently have seven secular companies and three nonprofits that I'm CFO over. And I do this. 
So how did I get into this? Um, I connected with a major uh, preacher, evangelist, international, that he and I made contact with each other. And uh, one thing led to another, and they ended up setting me up with some coursework of being able to teach, similar to what it is tonight, uh, back in Iron Mountain. And the classes felt impersonal. The why felt like it was missing. That I was preaching a lot, saying a lot, but I was lacking the follow-through. The people just were not following through. There was just, it became impersonal. And it became a kitchen table ministry where I sit at my kitchen table with folks like yourselves that just come and sit down. They bring all of their credit card statements. They come with their bank statements, their pay stubs. And we're going to do this weekend what I do for them privately at my kitchen table. There's success stories. There's lack of follow-through. All kinds of testimonies that have come from this. But what I've done for these families has become a passion and a ministry, and the Lord has simply given me a passion or a platform at this point in time to do this now beyond Iron Mountain. So thank you for having me here, and it's a privilege. It really is an honor. It's a privilege to be here. So the spiritual side. Your greatest spiritual battles will be against the things that are most important to, oh my goodness, that's Gog. Let's uh, ignore that for now. Uh, that should be a D. I'm sorry. <laughs> Typing quickly. So your greatest spiritual battles will be against the things that are most important to God concerning you. Discern diversion. Satan will try to cause spiritual battles between you and the positive, and Satan's intent is to isolate, separate, and divide. So debt. Does that sound like debt? Isolate, separate, and divide? Yeah. The tool of debt in the grip of Satan, uh, the Bible talks about strife as being the enemy against the household. I don't think debt is too far behind strife. So many marriages, and I don't remember exactly what statistic is. I think I've got it in here in a later slide as to how many marriages that the reason for divorce is money. Money. How many of our children are graduating college in deeper debt than the parents are with their mortgage because of student loans? And the student loans are, I mean, they just go on forever. Mind you, I just paid mine off last year. With all that education I just talked about? Yeah, I just paid it off last year. So diversion, distraction would be another word for that. Discern the distractions. We're going to talk about that. Satan is going to cause a spiritual battles between you and the positive. When you try to make something positive happen in your life, like here tonight, there's going to be a diversion. Whether it's a blizzard or the cold weather or a delayed flight, there's going to be a diversion, a distraction, opposition. You fought through. You're here. The Lord will honor your, uh, your efforts, your time, the investment you're making here. The Lord is going to honor it. Come expecting. Satan's intent is to isolate, separate, and divide. Deuteronomy 25.17 is such an amazing example of this. Remember what Amalek did to you by the road when you were coming out of Egypt, when he met you by the way and attacked at your rear all that were stragglers behind you when you were exhausted and weary. Debt does not fear God. The stragglers, when you're weary and tired, how easy is it to just simply fall prey to the flesh? Attacked at your rear for the stragglers. So again, I talk to those of you that are already knowing freedom. There are stragglers in your life. I know there are. Don't let them fall behind and become prey. For those of you that do have debt, we are going to bring you to the head and not the tail. Your decisions this weekend will have generational effects. It's your choice. So I'm going to go from this slide to... Ephesians chapter 4, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Familiar passage, but how appropriate. <clears throat> Excuse me. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The fivefold ministry. Highly esteemed, anointed of God, called out to be separate, 
sanctified for the Lord's purpose and leadership, where Pastor Andrew was just talking about, of the leader needs to be able to see the destination, where we're heading. That spiritual, insightful vision. Why the fivefold? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, and for the building up of the body of Christ. That's a calling. The equipping of the saints, the work of, for the work of service, and for the building up of the body of Christ. For those of you that are LifePoint members, right here at this front table, are your shepherds. They're the ones with the LifePoint vision. They're the ones that the Lord has called out in the fivefold. They are the ones that are here to catch you. You are allowed to lean on them. You're allowed to pull from them because they are your shepherd. You think about the relationship of a shepherd to a sheep, the direction, the leadership, the protection, to watch over your souls, and they have to answer for it. Highly esteem your pastor. Highly esteem the calling on an individual's life. Do we have any of the fivefold in here? Front row? Okay. I know there's more coming. So Pastor Randy and I are here in your lives with the same calling, even though we may not be your direct shepherd. Our phone number's on the internet. He's going to hand out brochures with our phone number. The Lord spoke to me before I came several times, and I'm going to share with you a couple of these visions that the Lord gave me. But the one that stood out is and I shared with Pastor Tommy last week. Because of your investment here, the Lord gave firm instruction that this family right here remains first. You are the priorities. I don't care what city you're from, and I don't care if you come to only one session for the weekend. Pastor Tommy knows who you are, and you remain first. No matter where Three Degrees Ministry goes, no matter who we get called to, we have a priority in this room here. So thank you for coming. But by the Lord's designation, you are first. And if that means coming to New York to bless your church sometime, just let us know. We'll find our way. California. Oh, the ones coming at are from New York. Okay. California, here's a nice place. I've not been there. Verse 13. Until we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a complete man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness with deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, the love may hurt. Love disciplines. We may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ himself, from whom the whole body is joined together and connected by every joint and ligament as every part effectively does its work and grows, building itself up in love. A couple of comments there. Number one, you cannot be effective if debt is holding you down. You cannot step into that calling and step into your vision and step into your purpose if your preoccupation is, where is my minimum payment coming from? God wants you free. He no longer wants you a slave. But to get there, speaking to you in love we're going to call out some choices that have been made that have gotten you here. So the very next slide, how did I get here? How did I get here? Why am I in this room? Why am I listening to some guy talk to me about debt? Priorities. What have your priorities been? What priorities do you need to lay bare before the Holy Spirit to let him deal with because they don't belong to you? What priorities are self-manufactured and not given by Holy Spirit? What priorities do you have that have done nothing but set you back further and further and further? What have you been running from? What have you been using to escape? Why are you in debt? What's the motive? Those are all questions to be asking. And again, I go back to my ground rule slide. When there's conviction, allow it to have its course. Be expecting. Whose signature was it? Who signed the note? Who signed for the new car? Whose signature? No more excuses, no more lies. And then some examples of people that have gotten themselves in trouble. God said to Adam, to Adam he said, because you listened. 
because of you. Who are you listening to? Haggai 1. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their due. Why are my ties not, ties not working? Why doesn't it seem like God's doing anything for me? Why are all the promises of the Bible not manifesting? Why does it feel so empty? Why do my prayers feel like they're just bouncing on the ceiling? Speaking to you in love. Malachi 3.7, very familiar. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how am I to return? I'm going to answer that for the rest of the weekend. I'm going to spend the next three days answering that question for you. How am I to return? How do I get back to a place where I am no longer ashamed of what I've done to my life, of what I've done to my family, of living check to check, of not putting away a savings of any kind, of going to sleep in fear at night, wondering how we're going to make it through the next day? I've been in all those situations. I've heard the stories. Again, you're in a safe place. There's no condemnation. I want to hear. Whatever you're comfortable in sharing in here over the weekend, it is your life stories. It's my life story that is going to allow the expectation in this room to lift up. Draw from each other until we all come into the unity of the body of Christ. Your story might be the very thing that he needs to hear. Your victory, that freedom, might be the very thing all of us need to hear. Lord's given all of you a voice, and we're all called to do the work of an evangelist. Okay. America today, national debt, 21 trillion and change. Every one of you owes the rest of the world $67,000. Who holds our debt? China? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. This amount does not include, okay, get this, it doesn't include what your local state, local agencies and your state agencies owe. Okay? It doesn't include the treasury bonds. Remember how big treasury bonds were 20, 30, 40 years ago? You'd buy your grandkids treasury bonds because it was a great saving tool, and in reality, inflation has only allowed them to actually lose value. It doesn't include Social Security or Medicare, which are both upside down in the untold billions. Social Security is broke, Medicare is going broke. That's what happens when man manages money. That's what happens when money gets the best of man. Okay. I do have credits down here. They're not showing up very well, but I just want you to know that I have given credit where credit is due. So, Americans paid banks $104 billion in credit card interest and fees in 2018. $104 billion in credit, credit card interest and fees. What if we were to reverse that and take that money back? Love it. We're going to get there. This is an increase of 11% from 2017 and 35% increase in the past five years. Based on proposed rate hikes yet that are, the Fed is talking about in 2019, the number is supposed to increase another 10%. That's the projected value is that we're going to go up another 10% this year. So if you add another 10% to that number, we're up to about $115 billion this year going for credit cards and fees. Credit cards are the most sensitive debt instrument to rate hikes. Let me explain what that means. Your credit card that you carry a balance on and have a revolving balance month to month is the fastest responding debt vehicle, debt instrument, to when the Fed moves the interest rate. It's the slowest when they lower the rate. It's the fastest when they raise the rate. More than double the amount of your mortgage and that is a very conservative number because some of you have 18% cards, some of your retail cards are 25%, but they're at least more than double than what your mortgage is. And the average credit card interest rate today is 15.5%. An American bank in 2017 reported that a 1% increase, which is what they're proposing this year, is three, excuse me, four quarter point rate hikes 
uh, in 2019 by the Fed, so it'd be 1%. So this bank reported that if the Fed does that, their interest income will go up, increase, increase above what they're already getting because of 1%. They're going to make an extra $5.3 billion this year in interest income. The bank. In American, uh, there's a good reason why you receive so many credit card offers. If we were to just save what you receive Friday and Saturday and bring them in Saturday night of all the credit card offers that this room receives in the next two days, I bet we'd have a pretty handsome stack up here in the front of the room. Why is that? What a waste. Sending out a billion credit card solicitations a year. Why would that be? There's quite a money trail, isn't there? $5.3 billion for one bank alone. They want you to take that solicitation and they'll be patient. One day that solicitation is going to arrive in your box for the 48th month in a row and all of a sudden you're going to look at it and say, oh, you know what? I could use this. And they got you. So Americans carry $687 billion in credit card debt that is not paid in full each month. That's our carryover debt each month. $687 billion of I need it now that we're still paying for. 44% of credit card accounts are not paid in full each month. Number of Americans who actively use cards, 175 million people. And when you have to be 18 in order to commit yourself to a debt instrument, think about that number. There's what, 330 million Americans right now, total? Average number of credit cards per customer, consumer, 3.1 plus another 2.5 in retail cards. So let's just say there's at least five or six cards in everybody's wallet. And those retail cards, we're going to talk about those in particular. Total American credit card debt and retail card debt together is over a trillion dollars. And the average balance per holder, husband and wife, would be $12,600, $12,700. But per holder, the average carryover debt is 6358 that they're paying interest on. Daunting numbers. All right. Pastor Gary Cassie, I am going to call that one out because Pastor Gary Cassie is a reference I'm going to leave you all with before we're done this weekend. As far as another individual that uh, Faith Life Church, he's on BVOV. He is in the KCM family. Uh, phenomenal teacher on finances and the Word of God. He's got a huge church in Albany, New Albany, uh, Ohio. But these are his stats that he gave in one of his messages. Nine out of ten families live paycheck to paycheck. Financial stress is a key factor in 80% of divorces, so it's 80%. That's the number I was looking for. Mortgage defaults are at the highest level in all of history. Six billion credit card offers are mailed out each year. Six billion. Interest payments are stealing the future of many American families. Interest payments, not the principal payments, the interest payments. The average 62-year-old still owes 22 years on their first mortgage, on a first mortgage, excuse me, and has only $2,300 in savings. That's a national statistic. And only 13% of the American population retires above the poverty level. And one out of 10 American families are on food stamps. I could put them up on the internet. I could, yeah, none of this, this is public information. Use it at will. I don't own any of this. I give credit where credit is due. It's yours. Teach it, use it, disseminate it, whatever. It doesn't matter. Absolutely. I could put these up on the internet. I could put the whole presentation on the internet, on the website. All right. Definitions. Last night, we were doing our devotion time with Elaine and Grace, and they sat down, they went through this whole presentation. 16 and 18 years old, and you know, like neither one of them had ever heard of t term or whole life insurance. And, you know, Dad, what does this mean? And it was really kind of fun to actually go through the presentation with them and answer their questions that they had. And uh, got into some of these definitions and TransUnion experience in Equifax, Equifax and no idea what these things were. And so my instructions for my family last night was to slow down and make sure that everybody in the room was understanding what I was talking about. So 
we're going to make sure that everybody stays on the same page here tonight. Credit. What is credit? And I'm already giving the answer, so it's not fair. I'm asking you a question. I'm already giving you the answer. Like a driver's license, credit is a privilege. It is not a right. A lot of us want to use it as it's our right. We wheel out a credit card so fast, it's my right. Pay for it. Credit is a privilege that's been abused. It's a privilege that has been misused, overused, and it has been catastrophic. Um, 911 happens, and because of money, we have businessmen that are throwing themselves out of 40 story buildings. 2008, when their crash happened, for money. Money is the root, a root, a root. It's not the end. Credit is not money, nor is it a loan. There are no installment payments for a credit card. The balance is due in full monthly. So there's a minimum payment, and then there's the balance that's due. I think all of us in this room understand that you cannot consider a credit card like you do your installment loan or like your mortgage. And credit is a financial tool that comes with a binding agreement. They can chase down you down, creditors, garnishings, they can chase you down if you don't pay your bill. It's a binding agreement. The credit report, so anybody in here not familiar with the credit report? TransUnion, Experian, Equifax. Are we all on the same page there? These are the three main credit reporting agencies and your credit report is going to have the identifiers of who you are, your current employer, all credit lines and loans. And boy, some of these are aggressive. They really can go deep. You co-sign on a loan, guess what? Here it comes. Your company issues you a credit card. There's a very high probability that that company credit card is sitting on your credit report. Uh, there are a couple of credit cards that I've had to call to say there is the primary on the account. They are the one that's responsible for the debt. These are just carriers of the card, of the account. Get them off the account. Well, we can't do that. It's not allowed. You don't need your social security numbers. You have to negotiate with the credit card company. It usually takes more than one phone call to get those subsidiary names, those secondary names removed from it being reported to the credit agency. Just giving you a little inside information after being in business for so many years. And then your credit score ranges between 350 and 800, and obviously the higher is the better for your credit report. There are ways to heal your credit report, to improve your credit report, but I stand before you this morning in saying your goal before God and your spouse and your family should be to never have to worry about that credit report again as long as you live. All right. Interest. That's a nasty word. Think of interest as rent. You are borrowing, renting somebody else's money. The same way that you would rent an apartment to go to bed every night, you are just simply borrowing somebody else's money, renting their money so that you can have today what you couldn't afford. That's all that interest is, and it can get really expensive. And Again, we'll get to that. It's a percentage-based fee on an amount of principal that's owed. Pretty basic definition. And the percentage is related to your risk. The better your credit report, or the shorter the note, the lower the, note, the, the interest rate on that note goes. It can be fixed or variable. Fixed, it's one interest rate, the life of the loan, no matter what the Fed does. Variable, like a credit card, it will jump the moment the Fed says jump. Um, $5,000 car loan at 8% over three years is going to cost you $641 in interest. That's just a simple analogy of your $5,000 purchase really wasn't $5,000 at all. $150,000 30-year fixed mortgage at today's interest rate of 4.7. Your monthly payment, $778, and your cost of loan after 30 years is $280,000. Interest. So we're going to find out this weekend what we can do to make sure that that mortgage even is paid off within the next 10 years and you own your home clean. And it is possible. And I'll let you in on a little hint. The debt ratio. Banks, because of auditors and the oversight that the FDIC has over banks, 
are not allowed to lend to you over 40% of your income. So that means it's 60% of your income that's available. By finding fragments, by readjusting how that money is paid with your minimums, restructuring, you will be shocked at what you can do with that ratio of 40%. You can be up to debt to 40%. It doesn't matter. More often than not, nine out of 10 times, 10 years or less. I'll show you an example of that and talk you through how to do it. Interest can be an enemy or a friend, and we're going to learn how to use interest to our advantage. Simple interest is the interest that's earned only on the initial principal, simple, and compound. What's compound? Do we know these definitions? Compound interest, it begins to be earned on the, it, it is earned on the accumulated interest as soon as it's paid, which occurs, in other words, as soon as the interest of the previous month hits that account, the next month that interest is added to the new amount for the new interest amount. Compound, it's compounded every month. The interest is always added onto the principal to recalculate what your interest is for the next month. It is interest on interest. There we go. All right, time value of money. Has anybody ever heard that term before? Time value of money? No? Okay. The time value of money simply means what is your money worth at a certain time or period from now or if you can work it backwards or forwards. There are some very complicated corporate financial formulas that they make you learn in school when in reality I'm going to show you one on the internet that you can go to and they are really, really kind of fun to play with. For me anyway. Um, if you were to start investing $1 a month for the next 50 years, $1 a month for the next 50 years, at 6% in 50 years, okay, your, your $1 a month is worth $37.87 at 6% interest. If you're in any type of account right now that's only paying you 6%, come see me. We need to talk. 12%. $39,000, 18%, $505,000, 21%, million, and at 28%, which is what some of these retail cards charge you, $43,882,000. And here is the motivation for the solicitations. The lenders want your business, and they want you to pay the minimum every month. They're looking for the minimum. By law, they've got to get you, give you how long it's going to take, 22 years to pay the card off. But they want the minimum. So a dollar a month for 50 years, 600 months, $600, $43 million. Compound interest can work to your favor. And that's just for $1. Our goal is to use interest to our advantage. How about a dollar a day? $30 a month. 50 years, you got 113,000 and 28%, you're at $1.3 billion at $30 a month. Time value of money. And it's going to work both ways. You pay your minimums, that's what you're paying away. The logic, the strategy, for every card you pay off at whatever interest rate is no different than putting that same money into an investment at that interest rate. Instead of paying that money out, it's no longer leaking from your budget. You're recapturing those funds so that you can reapply them to your own liking rather than being slave to the lender. Okay. And here's the calculator. So time value of money, and again, credit due. This is where I found the calculator, and this is one of the better ones because it's so simple. It's user-friendly. PV, present value. What is the present value of the cash, the asset. Payment, the future value, what is the interest rate, how many periods, and how often is it compounded, monthly or annually? You can get a calculator like this and punch in any value you want and it will return the void field. Let me explain. This is a present value calculation where I put in $100 a month for 20 years, okay? 
at 12%. That is a very reasonable investment that most of everybody in this room could make, that for the next 20 years, you're gonna put $100 a month into an annuity, into a retirement fund, into a mutual fund, and it will return to you 12%. So you hit um, the future value for the calculation, and what is that money going to be worth after the 240 periods, months, and the value of your $100 a month investment comes back at $98,925 is what that portfolio would be worth with that return. Does that make sense? Okay, and you can do this backwards. For those of you that wanted to retirement planning, you can put in future value. My lifestyle today, longevity, how long I wanna live, and what my lifestyle would be while I'm retired and not having any other income except for my retirement, I need this much money to live on, 1.5 million. Put it in here and it will return back to you and you can invest it at whatever interest rate and this is how far out it's going to be that you're gonna invest before you retire. You can punch in uh, present value and payment and it will return to you what you need to be doing to achieve your goal. Does that make sense? We can play around with this if we want to, like on another uh, session. Um, I do believe that we're all in agreement that for sure Saturday afternoon is going to be an open mic. That for as long as what we have questions and people still interested, Pastor Andy and I, Pastor Tommy, each other, we are just going to simply open the mic up for testimonies, for questions, for bringing anything to our attention that you want to talk about. It's going to be your time. You'll have received so much information by Saturday that it'll be a great opportunity for you to now try to go deeper into some of these areas. So if you want to play around with things like this or if there's anything we're talking about or I'm going too quickly, bring it up now and I can slow down and go back to a slide or we can bring it up again on Saturday, okay? I really want this to be your time. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I want this to be your time. This is about you, not me. This is what I do and I enjoy it, I love it, and the more you pull from me, the better I go home. Amen? And I'm telling you what, I'm coming in here full. I'm ready to start. I had a, a prophet about 12 years ago lay hands on me, and uh, his prophecy to, over me was, uh, you need your platform, and you need to be obedient for that platform to manifest. And the longer you push it off, the more the word inside of you is going to burn you up from the inside out. I didn't know whether to take that as a feel-good prophecy or, <laughs> wow, that was heavy. Um, but that word was spoken over me about 12 years ago, and then through a course of selfishness, immaturity, fighting with God, arguing with him, blaming him, um, I'm really just now, you are basically seeing that platform manifest tonight. I've been sitting around the kitchen table and doing this for several years, but as far as being on a platform in front of people, that prophecy really begins tonight. Amen. All right, time value of money. Now this next slide looks busy. And we're gonna revisit this one. It's not the only time you're gonna see this one. All right, what is this? Again, moneychimp.com, give credit where credit's due. It's the best graph I've seen as far as being all-inclusive. That not only is a great visual of debt, it's also a great visual of what retirement planning is about. Okay? The building of wealth or the depletion of wealth, depending on which side of money you're on right now. Let's use a mortgage, for example, to explain what this graph is showing. You have a $100,000 mortgage. Okay? You start making your payments on that $100,000 mortgage. At year 22 you've paid one half of your home. You now own half your home and the bank now owns half your home after 22 years. But because of the way that loans are front loaded, the other 50,000 gets paid off in eight years. So what about Americans that are so indecisive and so wishy-washy and so fleshly where after five years their home is boring and dull and they don't like it anymore? I don't like the color of my car, but I'm moving. Is that Maybe why a 62-year-old is still working on only owing a portion of their home because they're still sitting on owing 22 years on a 30-year mortgage yet? Coming into retirement? That's tragedy. Leave an inheritance for your children's children. That's the order for the church. That's what we're supposed to be. 
that doesn't work for me because of you. Ooh, but I love you. Yeah. Mixed message, isn't it? Hard message? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. All right. So 22 years gets you 50% of the way through your mortgage, and then there's eight more years left to fully pay it off, 30-year mortgage. On the other end of it, you can also look at this as if you start paying yourself fixed payments, principal payments out of retirement account in retirement, and you're able to calculate how long your retirement account is going to last at such a payment, but there's that depletion showing the green of if you're depleting something that's already yours, and the debt on the other side, and like I said, we're going to come back and visit this when we start talking about financial planning, wealth management. I don't do retirement planning. I don't do financial planning. I cover wealth management. It's the Lord's pleasure to bring wealth. We're going to learn how to be stewards of that. The true nature of debt. <clears throat> debt has become a weapon of Satan to destroy lives. It's a thief. Now think about some of these. Debt is a thief. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. How does debt steal time? You work to pay debt. How many of you are happily, joyfully, blissfully, satisfactorily employed? I got five hands. How many are retired? Okay, there's good. All right, congratulations on that. I hope you're enjoying your retirement. Well earned. Peace. How does debt feel peace? You, uh, you don't need to raise your hand, but how many of you take sleeping pills because of money? How many of you are on an antidepressant because of money? Do you know anybody that is stressed out to that degree because of money? Who said that? Oh, of course you did. <laughs> Relationships is self-explanatory, completely self-explanatory, debt destroys. In, in, you're not in agreement with your wife about spending. That's already a sour road. Uh, your tithes. Do you have to check your budget before you write the check? Do you have to balance your checkbook before you take the 10% that's already belonging to God? Hope. That's a self-explanatory one. Joy. Self-esteem. That's a big one. Self-esteem. Keeping up with the Joneses. How much of the stuff do we own right now because we got jealous? Vision. We kind of talked about that earlier. But that is a thief. It will steal your vision. It will steal your purpose. If there was no debt in your life, if you didn't owe a creditor and the money was all yours, what's your dream? What would you do? I have elation in this one gentleman back here. That's the look of <laughs> That's the look of freedom right there. So, and then the last one I have in here is your freedom to love. Helping the poor, being generous with family. You listen to Jesse Duplantz, if any of you are his followers in here, uh, his disciples. Um, Jesse gives wonderful testimonies. They all do, but Jesse's the one that is so funny. Um, but how many times that he has just simply been able to pay off somebody's house, buy another car, give something away. Vision, purpose. The freedom to love. The freedom to love. And it's not just at this level. But if you were debt free, if you weren't concerned about your checkbook balance, what about this relationship between you and your father? How much of your ability to trust him, how much would your faith be free to just believe? 
to just know him and to follow his lead because you are not looking back at the cost. People stay employed with no enjoyment in order to pay creditors rather than working towards their dream or their vision. That comment right there is where we're going to get into self-employment. And if there's any part of you that wants to pull from me about self-employment, it's my passion. In the secular world, the kingdom of God, especially the children of God, to see someone achieve that God-given purpose of being self-employed to serve or to create, to flow with their own passion, with their heart, I will stand beside you. I will pray with you. I will believe with you. I will work with you. Just be willing. Come vulnerable. Come trusting. Come able. <clears throat> Lust is never satisfied. There is always the bigger, faster, and shinier. Always. Lust. Proverbs 22.7, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. We are very familiar with that one. We sell our future to the lender to get what we want today. You're selling your future. And when I say that this weekend is going to allow you choices, it's going to affect for generations, I mean that and every word of it with all my heart. We sell our future to the lender to get what we want today. Your future involves your children and your grandchildren. Absolutely. Leave an inheritance for your children's children or leave them in this situation. By the end of this weekend, the Lord is going to hold you accountable for what you've attained. It's your choice. Life or death, blessing or cursing, it's your choice. Our value of a purchase equals the amount of effort invested to own it. Who wants to put that in their own words? Anybody want to volunteer? DJ does. <laughs> Our value of a purchase equals the amount of effort invested to own it. To go into a car dealership, we approve anyone at 22% interest, but we'll get anybody approved. And I asked earlier, whose signature is it? Who signed on the dotted line? And how much did you have to invest to sign on a dotted line in a place that says we approve anyone? You invested nothing. You walked in, I like that one, I'll take it in blue, and I'm going to drive it away now. It cost you nothing. As opposed to, let's save up. Let's believe God for the provision. Let's go into the dealership and say, I want that one, and it's going to be paid for. I don't need to talk to your loan officer. You know, listening to you do this, is this is exactly the way I've seen people treat ministry. I've seen people treat ministry exactly the same way. Instead of creating the foundation, instead of building it from the ground up first, so then you can reap later on. We want to reap. We want to have flash and pizzazz ahead of time. And, and it don't work. It just does not work. It's the exact same principle. So. All right. I just looked at the time. I'm having so much fun up here. I am not paying any attention. It's already going on 830 here. Wow, time flies. Okay, you guys have been sitting for a long time. If I got through what I'm seeing here as my next couple of slides, it'd probably be a decent stopping place. Um, you guys want me to quit? Let's get to, you know what? Let me do three more slides. And uh, you may not want to miss anything, but when I get into budget, and a balanced budget and finding fragments, that is a whole teaching that needs to just kind of flow at one time period, and I can't do it in 30 minutes. So why don't I go through a couple more slides, and I'm going to see if there's any questions as of tonight, and we'll close with the Lord's blessing. Amen. So contentment. Contentment versus lust. Godliness with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. True contentment comes from knowing who we are in Christ. I was honored with pastor asking me to preach on Sunday morning, and I believe that the Lord has given me a word that is not only timely, but it is going to be, I'll just give you a hint. The title is Position, Passion, 
prosperity. Position, passion, prosperity. We have to know who we are in Christ. We have to know God. And not only do we have to know God, we have to know that he is a good God. He's a good God. When you read scripture, you need to read it through the lenses, not these ridiculous things that Randy wore <laughs> earlier, but you need to read the word through the lenses of love. Old and new, through love. The uh, permissive tense of the Hebrew language has thrown so much of our church into such confusion that we have this awful thing called denominations. We just read about coming to the unity of the body of Christ. But that permissive tense of the Old Testament where it says that God did it rather than God allowed it. And if you want me to go into that in a detailed study, I could talk about Job for an hour. What a marvelous book of the Old Testament is the book of Job. Marvelous book. So true contentment knows from, comes from knowing who we are in Christ. Contentment. All right. So three weeks ago, recently, I wanted to get in a weekend, a family weekend. The kids were asking me to, to do something as a family, and I wanted to get something in before I was going to be gone all weekend. Because now when I go home, I'll work full days, Monday through Friday, as my other job. And basically, that's the little ones especially, not having dad for the weekend. And they're, hi, everybody. They're watching right now. Um, but that's as close as they're going to get to me this Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm making an investment, and so are they. All right? So we invest in our kids. So I took them to the Wisconsin Dells. And we were at a water park. And on Saturday afternoon, um, there's only so much water park you can do before you just need to kind of sit down. And Caleb and Eliana, which is the boy and then the, the blonde just beneath him, were just tearing up the playground area with this 500-gallon 500, 500 pail of water and the water slides and this five-story play structure. They were having a ball, and I was just sitting there having a ball myself just watching them. How fun to watch these two just tear up this playground and just squealing with laughter, just having a ball. And I'm thanking God for my kids. I'm thanking God for the provision of being able to go to Wisconsin Dells. It was paid for. Because of giftings that have been received from various sources for us, we did not pay for a thing. The giftings did. The blessing of the Lord did. So thanking the Lord. So I got into the spirit thanking the Lord, and I'm sitting there, and nothing is distracting me. I'm just watching these two. And uh, I said, you know, Lord, I'm hearing from you so easily right now. Tell me something about the conference. What am I talking about? What's going on? What am I walking into? Speaking in love. This is the Lord loving you. Sitting there in that chair in that water park with the thunder of the water around me and all the commotion and the activity, the Lord showed me a tornado. And I tried to go on YouTube in order to, you know, put a slide in here with video of a tornado. And as I was looking at tornadoes on YouTube, the Lord said, don't bother. You're not going to find one like I showed you. Don't bother. Because what I saw was a tornado. And it was not a huge tornado, but it was big enough. But it was relentless in its pursuit of grabbing anything it could get its hands on. Relentless. Just sucking everything and anything and not giving it up. Taking it. And the Lord said, look around. So there's very few, and this is a Saturday afternoon, and this place is packed. There are very few here that know me. He said, they're going to be at this water park and have a good time. And they're going to go home, and they're going to immediately start searching for the next thing the next escape, the next feel-good moment. They're going to spend more money in order to get away from what is reality in their lives. They're going to go deeper into debt, creating another cycle. Digging deeper, creating hopelessness that goes deeper, roots of bitterness that goes deeper, deeper divides in their marriages and their relationships, and getting themselves deeper and deeper and deeper until hope has vanished. Now, what's interesting is that he showed me that after I said, what am I walking into? You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you are experiencing a tornado? How many of you hear that and equate it to either yourself or a loved one or somebody that's close to you, where there is a constant grabbing, a constant suction to run away, to deny, 
to medicate. Enough is enough. Contentment. Contentment versus satisfied. We are created to always be advancing with God, not to settle or be satisfied with the status quo. God does want us to be content as we progress in him. So if I need to break that down a little bit, we are created to always advance. You've always heard preachers, teachers, your Sunday school teachers say there's only two directions you're going, either forward or backward. We are created to always go forward, not sit on a fence and not go backward. But you're always pursuing life or death. You're always pursuing blessing or cursing. You're always cons consuming or redeeming. Does that make sense? Okay. We are not to settle or be satisfied with the status quo. Pavlov's dogs getting conditioned. Human beings being conditioned. We get numb to reality. We grow numb to, the own, to our own self-inflicted harm. Randy was talking about that. The status quo. We do not remain in the status quo. God does want us to be content as we progress in him. So don't be satisfied with where you're at or this is enough. I'm making my monthly payments. What's the big deal? But rather be content and look for ways that you're going to progress with God. Where is God pulling you forward to advance you? And while he's doing that, it requires patience, but it requires being content. A mind at ease, okay? Contentment comes when we are where God created us to be. And again, Pastor Gary, success is not defined by what you have, it's defined by who you are. So on Sunday morning, we're gonna talk about position, passion, and prosperity. And I'll just let those words sit in your spirit for the weekend as I keep talking, and as you listen to Pastor Randy, but our position to understand what our Jesus has done for us. The love of our Father, Abba. And then being able to convince ourselves that we are not where he wants us to be. Allowing ourselves to believe that there truly is something else for us. That there's more. No matter how many disappointments, no matter how many hurts, no matter how many prayers that you feel have gone unanswered, that we are able to come into this room to honestly sit before the Lord and say, you're not only able, you are willing. You're good. <laughs> I've had some practice. <laughs> Um, never heard one talk. <laughs> no, we walked in here cold turkey, boys. <laughs> there was no rehearsal. There was nothing. This was Pastor Tommy saying, you know what? Let's do this. <laughs> he brought in a couple of rednecks from up north into this room yeah! thinking that we had something to say to y'all. We're available. That's what makes the difference. We might come from small towns and we may have limited experience, but we're available. Yep. So are all of you. And the more you come into these freedoms that we're talking about here, the more available you become. The more available you become, the more your passion grows. The more your passion grows, what's next? Come on, message, Sunday. You get your position, passion increases. And with increased passion, there's nothing hindering God's hand anymore. Amen. Nothing. Amen. Nothing. All right. Life with no debt. Freedom and peace. That word freedom, let it become so loose on your lips that you can spill it out at any point in time. Tomorrow over breakfast, freedom. I'm free in Christ. Christ has made me free. The truth has set me free. Start reciting that to yourself till you believe it. Freedom of love restored at whatever cost it takes, no matter what sacrifice. I will cliche that with this little saying here, my method of debt freedom 
requires you not to change your lifestyle. What? Okay. Who said what? You? Yeah. Again? <laughs> the peanut gallery. <laughs> <laughs> love you, man. <laughs> Freedom of love restored. Faith works by love. God is love. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost until we're all united in love. Freedom of love restored. Debt freedom. Clear vision. Hopes renewed. Destiny with purpose and influence. Who are the most influential in America? So we may not ever grow up to become the next billionaire. That's up to you. It's your choice. But your influence, my influence, another thing the Lord said to me before I came down here is, in your testimony lies your credibility. In your testimony lies your credibility. Make a testimony. And become that credible witness to a lost and dying world. Become that why factor that has the influence of saying, been there, done that, won't do it again, and this is how I got out. Amen. Become the why. Who are going to be the leaders? The ones with freedom. The ones that are free to love get the promotion. That comes with position. The clear vision, leaders in this room, you need to have that clear vision. So your hopes and then your destiny with purpose. And I do believe that this slide is a good place to end. Where do you begin? That is one of the hardest words in the American culture. Our news is full of lies. Politics are full of lies. Business is full of lies. Every man for himself, dog eat dog, doesn't matter who you crush, may the best man win. Honesty. Are you able to be honest with yourself, your spouse, and before God? If you can answer yes to that question, you are so far ahead of the pack, it's not even funny. You've already destined yourself to victory. But the moment you lose the ability to be honest, you're defeated. You're defeated. You're done. Honesty, when I say when you make your budget, you're going to pull out every bill and you're going to write it down, it's not only every bill, it's every IOU you've ever created in your life. Christians repay their debts. That's part of our stewardship. If you've ever made an IOU to your late lost uncle and he still has a surviving spouse or surviving child, pay him back. Every penny. Be, be faithful. Okay? All right. Every debt. You list them out. You guys could start on that tonight if you wanted to because that's going to be the first assignment. Every single debt. List it out with what you owe and how it's being paid currently or are there no terms at all and you haven't made a payment on it in 45 years. What do you owe? Everyone. Honestly. All bills, all debts, including family. You make a budget, the cash reserve, and then here's the motto. A balanced budget does not mean you need to change your lifestyle. Raise your hand if what you've heard tonight is too good to be true. Honesty, right here, from our leaders in the room. Honesty. Sounds like a lot of promises I've made to you tonight, doesn't it? Anybody else want to raise their hands? Sound too good to be true? My people perish for lack of knowledge? No more. I told Pastor Randy over dinner tonight, which, by the way, the restaurant here is great. Um, they made guacamole right in front of our table, and it was so good. I, right here. Right, there. right in front of us at our table. Healthy, and it was delicious. It really was good. She was great. Good service. Um, and he paid the bill, so it was even better. <laughs> <laughs> 
I told Randy tonight at dinner that uh, the lack of knowledge ends now. That this meeting is not just going to be another meeting. So tomorrow when I get up here again and have another opportunity, we're going to revisit some of these ground rules slides. And I'm going to again remind you, get out of your head, get into your spirit, and be expecting. But now that we have flashed through so many of these slides, I need to be prayerful about who's attending tomorrow because all my information builds on the previous session, and if they're not live streaming, they've missed a whole lot of meat here. They missed a whole lot of meat here. So we need to be praying for those that may join us. We want them to join us. We don't want anybody to stay away because I missed the first session. So you can start working on this. But is there anybody in this room, and I mean this with all my heart, this is a natural and spiritual journey. Is there anybody in this room that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior or your relationship with our Lord is such that it feels strained or without effect in your life and you want us to pray with you? Anyone at all? You can just raise your hand. You can just wink at me. <laughs> Honesty. All right? Honesty. You'll have opportunity for that all weekend here. That you have leadership up here. You're fivefold. The power and the anointing of laying on of hands and believing with you for whatever your need is. So maybe, uh, Pastor, we could put out a basket or a bucket or something for prayer requests to come forward that people could drop off after, during, before sessions and that the leadership could pray over here at, during the weekend. So, any questions? Comments? Three hours enough? Yes, sir. Starting point. I mean, you, you gave us that. I mean, there's, I feel like there's something within, you know, I know honesty, you know, but somewhere I'm, I'm trying to connect with a starting point taking all this information. I feel like just laying out before the Lord. And I'm sensing the need to receive some things. I should be giving you the microphone here. <laughs> I, you know, that, I don't know where, I, where either, either there's another step that I need to connect to, or maybe that's coming. But what I'm, what I'm sensing is a drawing uh, to beginning. You know, I know where I'm at. And I believe I know where I want to be, but it's it's like okay now, right now, and I I, I don't know if that I'm asking that question. Yeah. Yeah. No, very fair question. Where do we start? I've got here. Where do I begin? And he's honesty. That doesn't seem to be the first step. Is there something before the honesty that has to happen? So I go back to my first slide. What's your priority? What's your priority? When you wake up on Monday morning, the meeting's over, the fellowship is done, and all the accountability has ended, what's your priority? Is your priority going to be that usual latte for five bucks? Or is your priority going to be, Lord, I'm going to do this right this time. I've got a budget. I'm going to stick to it. My budget says I can have two lattes a week, not five. So what are your priorities? If your priorities are straight before you and the throne, coming boldly before the throne of grace to receive his wisdom, James 1, where his wisdom is always sufficient, it's given without prejudice, he's no respecter of person. The peace of your heart, and I'm going to be talking about the Lord's peace, and if you are not sure about hearing your shepherd's voice and being certain of your shepherd's voice, one thing that you can place confidence in is if you go before the Lord, especially repeatedly, like the widow that went before the judge, and peace prevails, the peace of your heart maintains and becomes the dominant emotion in your body, you're in place. It's a great leader for you. You're never to be led by emotion. Emotion was not created to man for man to be a leader. Don't ever, ever, ever allow emotion to lead. Peace leads and the voice of God leads. So you go ahead and lay yourself out before your Lord and you ask him, Lord, what about my priorities? And if he says your priorities are straight and you've got peace and moving forward that's your priorities and that you are determined to get this done, 
then you've already accomplished honesty. Yeah. And you are definitely ready to step in and start doing this. Does that answer your question? No. Yep. Closing anything? You want to get the facts and don't take any, don't take any out. Be brutally honest. Get all the facts because you, you can't make decisions without facts. You can't make decisions without information. You can, I can't get part of the, you know, information and go, well, well, I'll just ignore that. I'll put off that off to the side. It's gotta be everything. Get all the facts. And then what you're going to get tomorrow and the next day is some wise counsel on how to apply those facts. And then develop a wise plan and execute it. So it's, it's really simple. It's just get the facts, get wise counsel, and then make a wise plan. You know, common sense. Use common sense. In this room is common sense. This is a common, there's more the people who have been through things. So we use one another. We're the body of Christ. So what you've been through, he needs to hear what he needs to hear. And we, we have we bring it together for common sense to make our wise plans. This is this is how we how we go faster.